Hello there, this is uh, Stephen White and this is Carlisle Library Calling. Uh, this is uh, another in our series of local studies talks and today the subject is Silleth, a celebration. So from about 1860 to, to about 1960, when Carlisle folks said they were going on holiday, you would just presume that they were going to go to Silleth. I mean, one or two foolhardy people might have gone to Morecambe or Blackpool, but most people, it would mean a trip to Silleth. And it's been estimated that uh, in the summer months, the population of Silleth would swell from about 3,000 people to something like 10 or 11,000. And here you can see a view, uh, a busy day at Silleth. And here is a busy station. This is a Silleth trade. Look at the crowds of people in the 1930s waiting to board to get down to Silleth. Because of course, your holiday was in Silleth. How did you get to Silleth? You went on the train. So let's take the train down. There's the uh, Silleth Bay in the uh, background there. You can see the uh, citadels and there's English dam side. And here we are, Carlisle, first stop Kirk Andrews, Bruff by Sands, Drumbruff, Kirkbride, Abbey Town, Black Dyke, Silleth. It's about a 50 minute ride. This is a timetable, obviously a, a winter timetable as there's no Sunday service. So we set off and we pass through the canal shed, which we see there, the coal chute in the uh, background and the canal shed itself. And the first stop, was Kirk Andrews on Eden. Here you can see a diesel haul train uh, coming in from Silleth towards Carlisle. This is a photograph taken from the overhead road bridge and you can immediately see it's just a single line. Again, in the 1960s, a uh, steam hauled uh, train passing through Kirk Andrews on Eden. And here you have a photograph taken from uh, the platform looking towards the bridge where those previous photographs were taken. And this gentleman with the sign over his shoulder is Mr. Bob Hope and he was the porter at um, Kirk Andrews and he'd lived at uh, Kirk Andrews station since he was about nine or ten. As you can see the line's already been lifted. Then it's off again and the next stop was Bruff by Sands a quiet rural station. Quiet? Perhaps not so. This is the 6th of September 1964. This is the last train from Silleth passing through the station. That's why the crowd of people are out there taking their photographs, recording this occasion. On the left there you can see the head of two lads. One was the fireman, Michael Bullman. The other is the driver, uh, Jimmy Lister. I knew Jimmy Lister and he was a gentleman. He only died a couple of years ago. And this is a photograph taken of Rough by Sands station in the 1990s after it's been closed, but you can still see it's very much the station, isn't it? You can see the platform and the line ran right up through that greenhouse. So you'd leave Rough by Sands and then it would be across the marsh. There's a photograph taken from the footplate and you would come to Drumbruff. And believe it or not, Drumbruff was a junction, this quiet rural line, actually at a junction, you changed here to go to Port Carlisle. So now we're going to have a little bit of history. In 1823, a canal opened between uh, Port Carlisle and Carlisle. The canal basin was at the back of cars. This was promoted by the industrialists of the city. They wanted better transport links to support the industry, particularly the cotton industry. Carlisle was a cotton town. Over 6,000 hands were employed in the area in the cotton business. Cotton had to be got from Liverpool quickly and cheaply, so they promoted a canal. But already by the 1820s, canals were perhaps yesterday's news. The 1830s, the Newcastle and Carlisle line was going to open. So, the um, canal was drained in 1853 and a track simply laid in its bed. And this was going to be the Carlisle, Port Carlisle train uh, line, which opened in 1854. The interesting thing about it is, if you look in the papers in 1854, there's hardly a mention of the opening of the line. There's no big deal, there was no band played, no dinners, no toasts. That's because the promoters were already casting their eye down the coast towards Silleth. They were looking for a new harbour for Carlisle. They were looking for a wet dock. Silleth 
was their preferred choice. Port Carlisle was really only available uh, for two hours in a high tide. Uh, the channel shifted. It was a dry dock, in other words, when the tide went out, ships had to lay on their hulls. This was no good at all for a, a burgeoning city like Carlisle. So they decided to develop Silleth. And to do that, they simply struck her from Drumbruff to Silleth. The original line went to Port Carlisle. And after the Silleth line opened, there was so little traffic, it didn't justify a steam engine. And so you get the famous dandy coach introduced in 1857, withdrawn in 1914. And here you can see the dandy coach at the intermediate stop between Drumbruff and Port Carlisle. This is Glasson, and that's Glasson Station, a really rare photograph. And here, this is Port Carlisle Station, and there's the dandy coach, the horse-drawn locomotive. All this is gone today. Uh, the station buildings, but if you're in Port Carlisle, uh, the Bowling Green car park, just stand in the middle of it, look down at your feet, and there you can clearly see the line of the platform is still there. And there, that is a picture uh, of the uh, last day of the Dandy service. Uh, historically interesting, the Dandy itself is in the National Railway Museum in York, and you wonder, could the horse pull all that lot? Well, the answer is yes. So from 1914 to 1932, it was um, replaced by a steam locomotive, uh, but then that entire service was withdrawn. So back to Drumbruff Junction. And there you can see Drumbruff Junction change for Port Carlisle. Uh, I think it's an interesting feature that when you're doing your family history, all of us can find a railwoman somewhere along. And this is why, look at this. I mean, this is a small rural branch and these are some of the staff involved with it. Here again, this is Drumbruff. There's a, a, the plate layer on the left there with his impressive pair of clogs. And on the right there, Drumbruff, you can see these are the railwaymen, signalmen, porters, all members um, of the North British Railway. So on we go to Silleth. The first stop was Kirkbride. And this is Kirkbride just before closure. Next stop, Abbey Town. Abbey Town just before closure. The line from Drumbruff to Silleth was very easy to make. There were a few sand dunes to drive through. There was the River Waver to cross. And this is a photograph taken. It's a bank holiday special uh, leaving uh, Carlisle, going to Silleth. This is a photograph taken uh, by Peter Brock, who was actually the fireman on this engine. He was a very accomplished photographer. Uh, and as somebody pointed out to me, what's happened here is he's posed the engine or locomotive on the bridge, and then he's got out and he's run. Knowing Peter, he probably didn't run. He's sauntered along the bridge. He set up his camera on the other side, and he's taken this very nice photograph. But out of sight to the left, there's eight or nine carriages full of Carlisle people who want to go to Silleth. So what they must have made of this, I don't know. But thank goodness he took it. Uh, and the last stop was uh, Black Dyke Halt. And this is the last train uh, departing Silleth. And here you can see Mr. Glass. This is the, uh, the gatekeeper's wife, the gatekeeper's husband, has whitewashed on the wall his sentiments about the closure of the line. It was a beaching cut, of course. We want the line. So it was down the hill, as fast as you like, into Silleth Station. And here you can see Silleth. It was just a single platform, but extensive sidings going to the uh, cattle, pens, and of course, uh, cars bay. And a photograph of the front of Silla Station with a sort of massive glass vestibule type effort. Now, people uh, who remember Silla, they remember it fondly. And what they remember about the, the station is one was the smell of Jay's fluid permeated everywhere. And the other thing is that they remember there's a machine there that you put your penny in and you could stamp your name out on an aluminium strip. And I seem to remember um, seeing those machines elsewhere, all that for a penny. So, the idea was that Silith was to be the new port 
um, supporting Carlisle's industry. And here you can see Sir James Graham cutting the first sod of the new wet dock so that ships wouldn't have to lie in their uh, bottoms. The, when the tide was out, the gates closed, securing the water. So at the same time, it suddenly occurred to the promoters, well, why don't we develop Silth as a holiday resort? And that's what they did. And all sorts of puff were produced, proving that Silloth actually is the sunniest place in Britain, has the purest air in Britain, has great temperatures, it's got more ozone than anywhere else. In fact, it was just the place to go. And here you can see uh, the official guide to Silloth, Queen of Quiet Health Resorts. So what did Silloth have to offer? We're just going to have a look now. Uh, and of course, it had the sea. And here you can see, this is a photograph taken in 1928. It's some uh, sisters and some cousins just paddling, having a great time. A postcard from Martins uh, of the West Beach at Silloth. Now, I truly hope that the photographers overexpose this view because otherwise it's looking incredibly uh, bleak and wintry. There's the thousand foot long pier in the background. As you can see, it's suffering from subsidence. So in this next view, it's been shortened. And again, I don't know who these people are. These are just the majority of the pictures I'm showing you are views that people have brought into the library and just said, I found this, do you want this? And I think when you see them put together, they do tell a story. So don't throw your old photographs away. Bring them into the library and we'll use them. So I imagine this is the grandfather, the grandma and the grandson. And I particularly like this because the grandma, she's really got her skirts tucked up. She really is meaning business. Whereas this gentleman here, well, he's hardly bothering, is he? And here you are again. This is a, a Carlisle group having a picnic on the West Beach. The West Beach again. And there you can see the intricate lattice work. All these are, are Silith. And here is actually somebody sunbathing in Silith. Silith's got one or two famous connections, but none more famous than this lady here, because this is, of course, Kathleen Ferrier, who was married to the bank manager. Internationally famous, a superstar. And I don't think uh, I'm building her up too much. Um, the, the famous uh, German conductor, who was called Bruno Walter, said uh, that his musical experiences uh, were knowing Kathleen Ferrier and Gustav Mahler. And that, as far as he was concerned, was the correct order. She was a marvellous singer. If you hear um, Kathleen Ferrier today, you, it's unmistakable. And she was the bank manager's uh, wife. And she entered various musical uh, contests in, uh, in and around the area. And then in 1937, she made her first steps to fame and fortune. She entered the Carlisle Musical Festival. She won the Contralto, and then she won the Rose Bowl uh, for the best singer. She went on to uh, get to know Malcolm Sargent, uh, and literally it was a stellar, a stellar career, uh, cut tragically short by her death in 1953, uh, aged 41. Well, you could also play golf, and Silith still has a championship course. It's rather a nice poster, isn't it? Silith on the Solway, finest seaside golf. And there you can see a second very famous Silith connection. It's a lady called Cecil Leach, and she was the doctor's daughter. She and her sisters actually made a nine-hole golf course uh, at Silith for their own use. She uh, became the uh, British ladies. Uh, open champion in 1914, 1920, 1921, uh, and again in a year I forget. She won five French national championships, a Canadian national championship, and she brought a new dimension to the ladies' game. And you can see it in this photograph here. She brought woof, determination. She really struck the ball. There's no daintiness here. You know, a formidable golfer. And I think this photograph shows that. Play golf? Then you could go and have a look at the donkeys. And here are the donkeys, and more donkeys, 
on the green, of course. The green's one of the, the features of South. And here you can see uh, people sitting in their deck chairs. And just the sheer size of the, the green. Merry-go-round and boats. And then here's a couple of photographs of tourists. This is, I quite like this. There's a gazebo in the background and the lady in the forefront really dressed up, looking sternly across to Criffle. And this next one must be one of the earliest photographs of anybody, any uh, holiday makers for Silith. This is a group of uh, Silithy holiday makers, the 21st of September, 1867. Silith was still being built at this time because before it was a rabbit warren, it was a, um, a planned town. The architects were a Liverpool firm called Hay. Uh, and at this time, 1867, they were still building the streets, still building the church. So then we go down, the top end of the green was what they call Happy Valley. And here you had the Piros. Now the Piros were there from the Edwardian times up to the Second World War. And here you can see birthday greetings from Silith. And you can actually see the prices of the performance. The performances were daily at 2.36 and 8.15. The circle seats were sixpence and then there was threepence and then the hill was tuppence halfpenny. And I wondered what does that mean because there's no hill there. But I think this next photograph perhaps explains it. You can see the great crowd crowded at the back. These are the tuppenny halfpennies at the back. And there's one lady at the, at the very front. She's presumed a sixpenny. Maybe not. Maybe yes. Um, they were there for the summer months and it was very simple family entertainment. Slapstick, songs, the piano, a bit of dancing. They're dressed in their traditional Piro outfits, big white costumes, these big red buttons. What else could you do? Well, you'd have a parade around. And here you can see our four sisters and the cousins uh, with their bobbed hairstyle. This is 1928. You'd go down, walk down to the, the uh, thousand foot long pier and you'd see what was happening. Uh, and in this particular case, you can see the balloon is down, which indicated to the uh, incoming ships that there wasn't sufficient water in the channel for them to enter the dock. In this next view, you can see there is sufficient water in the channel and a ship is coming in. But you can just see people wandering up and down across the railway tracks. And here you can see uh, a ship that's particularly associated with Silith. This is the, the Yarrow. Again, the balloon is up. But look on the right. It's totally unguarded. You could just fall over. Health and safety would not allow anything like this today. So Silith uh, was a busy port. It was an international port. You could go from Silith to Liverpool and back again, Silith to Douglas on the Isle of Man, and Silith to Dublin. Uh, and what was carried? Well, the principal things were cattle, some uh, Guinness, uh, guano, uh, chemicals, and of course, this is the uh, Cars Bay wheat from Canada. Next one is a, is a, a photograph uh, of women workers. These are cars, women workers at the mill. And whenever you see a photograph like this, you think uh, that's probably a war photograph. And indeed this is. And the giveaway, if you need a giveaway, is if you look closely at the sack of flour, it says war grade. So it's still a busy port, Silith. And here you can see a photograph taken in the 1990s and they're sucking up the wheat with these giant vacuum cleaners. So you'd have a wander around. You'd look at the coal chute. The carriages were... The coal carriages were put into the coal chute, elevated up and then poured down into the holds of the ship. That would be uh, an entertainment. And you were free just to wander around the goods yards. Nothing to hold you back at all. And if it was raining, Silith had a cinema, the Majestic Cinema, 1920 to 1972. I believe that's the spa today. So, you'd had a paddle. You'd wandered down, you'd played golf, you'd been on the donkeys. What would you do? You'd go back to your boarding house and hotel and write your postcards. So here you've got some postcards from Silith. And in quite a number of occasions, the postcard would be simply back to Carlisle. Full of messages from Silith. I'm in full swing at Silith. Just a line from Silith. It's a bit corny, I know, but there we are. It's a good one. Now, this next one had to be explained to me, so I'm not embarrassed at all to explain it to you. Just a line from Bracing Silith, Seaside Attractions Weeds. 
In the middle of the photograph is, of course, uh, the young mother wearing the widow's weeds. She's just been widowed, and that's her child looking out to sea. On the left is, of course, this gentleman dressed in white, who's far too old for her. I mean, I don't like the look of him at all. And his seaside attraction is, of course, the widow's weeds. It's a little work of art. This is a great one as well. The new tub line, Paddle Steamship Company, still at the Isle of Man. And when you look at it, it actually is a tub, isn't it? And when you look at the front, the masthead is actually a lady and she's being sick and nothing's held back. You can actually see the detail. And the, uh, the sailor is trying to get some wind in his umbrella. It's been pulled by two geese. At the back, well, he's defying gravity, isn't he? How is he holding on? Somebody's just about to have their head cut off by the paddle. There's the life boy, B-O-Y. Uh, somebody's trying to blow some air into the, uh, into the sails. The whole ship, the whole, the whole thing is just a, a little work of art. And then, this is the last train from Silleth, and I believe the last train from Silleth could be fairly uh, a raucous affair, and probably this is a certain truth. There were um, corridorless carriages, and so you get a real mix of people. On the right there is the vicar who is looking rather indignant. What is it? Is it the courting couple or the howling babies? And here is definitely one that uh, is not quite correct today. One pearl and two plain. So often with postcards, it's worthwhile uh, turning them round and reading their message. And let's have a look at this one. This is to a Miss Nicholson. Uh, one, 15 rather, uh, Jackson Place, Botchigate, Carlisle. This is where the new County Council building is down Botchigate today. The date is the 21st of July, 1926. It's from Sally and Sally is having a week's holiday in Silleth in July. So obviously the weather's going to be baking. What does she write? I got the parcel, thanks very much. I wish it was time to come home, I'm fed up. It's cold and wet, it's not doing me any good at all. <laughs> Poor old Sally. This one, having a grand time here, it's very wild today. And that one again is just back to 100 Charles Street, Carlisle. It was decided that it was to be a, a beaching cut. It was said that although uh, on a bank holiday or a Whit Monday, uh, over 3,000 tickets had been sold on the railway to Silleth from Carlisle, uh, this was just the exception and through the week it was a very quiet service. So it was announced on the 3rd of March 1964 the service to was to be withdrawn. And this is a, a picture of that last train. Look at that crowded platform. I've shown this before. I've shown, uh, on several occasions, I've shown slides and somebody in the, the audience has said, oh, I know that person, and they've pointed somebody out, a face they recognise. So here you can see the last train just about to depart. Look at the crowd. And there you are, it's pulling out, leaving people behind. There was a tremendous fuss and to-do. There was a, a bomb scare, a wreath was placed on the front of the train. People actually uh, poured over onto the track there were promises made that if you voted Labour, if Harold Wilson got in, the line would be saved. Well, Labour did get in, but it didn't save the line. They called it the Great Train Robbery. Silleth never saw such a funeral, and the station was going to, uh, wasn't going to be redundant. It was going to be made into a bus station straight away. Well, following the 6th of September, uh, here you can see a photograph showing the removal of the, the furniture from the station. The, li the track was lifted very, very quickly. So quickly and far, in fact, that these uh, camping coaches, this is Silleth, these camping coaches were left behind because the track had gone. It's a, it's a, good, it's a good view, this. I'm, I'm not sure what's happening here. The gentleman is obviously relaxed in, the, in his deck chair. There's a lady who looks like evening dress to to my eye, but the best feature of the lot is this other lady with an immense frying pan. She's, uh, she's asking what he wants for lunch, I suppose, or dinner or tea. So the line was withdrawn and Silas was neglected. Here you can see the pier. This is all gone now, uh, washed away in the tide. The station, which was to become a bus station, 1973. Uh, this is um, 
uh, nine years afterwards, vandalised uh, and looking an utter mess. Now, on one unique occasion, I've said that in the past people have said to me, oh, I recognise that face, that's blah, blah, blah. But only on one occasion has somebody stood up and said, I know that horse, and I will pass it on to you, that's John T. Graham's horse. And there you can see the station took that photograph in the 1980s, looking really sad and bedraggled. There are one or two signs, uh, or there were one or two signs of uh, railway uh, life. Here you can see a train coming in from Carlisle and a train just about to go out. Uh, the system worked on what they call the token system. There's one token for each section. If you had that token, you knew it was safe for you to proceed. You can see the signalman's come down from the box on the right and he's on this little structure which gives him elevation so he can receive the token from the incoming train and then he can give that token to the outgoing train. So here you can see the token being uh, exchanged at Drumbruff. He's just gone onto this little um, bit of scaffolding almost. When I took this photograph a few years ago, there you are, that's what the porter, or rather the signalman, would have, would have stood up on to give him that extra height. So, just to go back to the 6th of September, this is how the newspaper recalled that day. Dr. Beeching and Willie Whitelaw, of course he was the local, the local MP, we better hurry up, Doc, or miss the last train. And the last train, as I say, uh, was, uh, <laughs> could be fairly boisterous is one word. This is a, uh, a postcard, uh, you know, showing the crush, dog and man, and everybody was fighting to get on the last train on top, through the windows. But just to leave Silith on a, on a bright note, this is a photograph taken by uh, Peter Bock. It's a magnificent photograph showing a, uh, a J39 just uh, in the dock there. So, I uh, hope you've enjoyed our little look at Silith and um, perhaps we'll do some more. So thank you very much for listening. Bye-bye. My name's Stephen White and I used to work in Cumbria Libraries and this is one of a series of talks on local history subject. It's just my take on the talks, talks that you'll be able to find on Facebook and YouTube. Some might be right, some might be wrong. If you've got any comments, get in contact, got any suggestions, I'd love to hear from you.